Funky politics. Funky politics show. Funky politics. Funky politics. Funky politics. Funky politics. Powered by MLGW. Memphis like gas and water. Listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. I'm DC, sitting right here along with me, Latanya Robinson. How are you, Latanya? I'm good, but why can't I be LT? Okay, you're LT. LT in the house. LT's in the house. And let me tell you, folks, we have a premier sponsor. Our presenting sponsor is MLGW. That's Memphis Light, Gas, and Water. We have the best darn water in the world, at least in the country. MLGW, and you're right here on Funky Politics. It's been a funky week. It's been a funky month already, and it's getting even funkier. You know, it's President's Day today, and it's so <laughs> funny it. because it's Code Forty Five Day. No, yes. but but, <clears throat> but people are so excited to celebrate President Obama today. President okay. celebrating those okay. forty four out of forty five presidents. I read a poll today that said that our current president has now denounced James Buchanan as the worst president. Oh, he's dethroned him? <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. James Buchanan had been seen as the worst president up until today. And you know what? I'm like President Trump. I think I saw James Buchanan like a week ago. He's still <laughs> serving, you know. He's anyway, you know. Let me tell you something also. Let's let's go. Let's hit this thing here. Thirteen indictments. Uh, let me tell you, Special Counsel Robert Mueller. Uh, he has dispelled this facts that uh, the the this thing that it's a hoax. Y'all, this is fact. There were some agents out there that were actively trying to assist the Trump presidency or the Trump campaign to be uh, to win the presidency. And it worked. The, the it crazy worked. part about it is that it's not over. We still have to follow the money trail. Yeah. You know, where does the money trail lead? Because that's where the real fireworks and the real excitement happens. Hey, let me tell you something. Paul Manafort, they're talking about another uh, another indictment on him possibly Gates. coming up. And Gates, Gates is flipping. Gates is flipping. He's talking. Let me tell you something. If I were the president, and I was, I was listening to somebody the other day, and I think it was David Gergen. So if I was the president, I'd be worried right about now. I think I'd be worried right now. I don't know anybody else that can withstand all of this pressure. Maybe that's why he's tweeting so much. So he's worried. You know, his latest tweet, instead of talking about President's Day, instead of talking about what's happening in Florida, he decided last night to yeah. attack Oprah. And to Not start Oprah. De- Oprah and to start deflecting for the 2020 election, saying that he wants her to run because it shows how insecure she is. Oh, wow. Well, Oprah... I feel for you if you've got the president talking about you. That means you must be doing something good. Don't you know what run, it means? Though, it means she's black. Oh, wow. She's black. If you think about everybody he's talked about, they've been black. Who has he not talked about? Russia or Putin? Well, i tell you who's not going to be on this show today. It's not going to be Vladimir Putin. <laughs> he's not going to be on the show. I've called him. He said he can't do it. Can't do it, huh? He can't do it. I went through some back channels. But anyway, uh, on the show today... We've got, uh, man, I tell you, we got Mendel Grinter. Mendel Grinter is the executive director of the Campaign for School Equity. Uh, they've got a book out, a recent book they've written, um, an, American, I mean, uh, an Education Dream. And then, of course, we have got Terry Freeman, our good, good, good friend, Terry I Freeman. I have become such a huge fan of Miss Freeman and all yeah, the work that club. she's doing she's got a fan at club the National there. Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis. I mean, she has really taken the museum to the next level. That's why folks right here on Funky Politics on the Kazuki Network, always stay with us because we're real, we right, and we're going to always be funky with funky. you. Funky! Funky! I'm Taquilla Banks, Executive Vice President with TNTP and a member of EDLOCK. This is Robert Jackson, National Speaker, Educational Consultant, and author. And you're listening to Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Funky Politics. Funky, Funky Politics. Politics. Powered by the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! Plus one lip sync champion, Latasha Peoples. Staring in the mirror, gonna change my ways. I want to make Memphis a better place. I see a neighbor in me. What can be done 
Instead of buying shoes or a pretty dress with just a dollar a month, you can help the rest. It starts with you. Plus one. You know, giving back through Plus One will make a difference for families in crisis. It starts with you. Plus One. Grandma's message couldn't have been any clearer. If you want to change Memphis, look in the mirror. It starts with you. Plus One. I remember when we got help from Plus One. And now we're helping others. Hey, Memphis, you can make a change. You too can make a difference. Funky politics. Listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. I'm DC, your host, and uh, unfortunately, my regular co-host is out today. But I've got my trusty friend Latanya Robinson sitting in with us. Hey, Latanya, how are you today? Hey, DC, how's it going? Man, just glad, glad to see you again. Glad to be here on this warm February day. It's hot, <laughs> and for some odd reason, it. I've got a hoodie on. <laughs> I don't know why. You cool like that, huh? I'm cool like that. Okay. Anyway, you know, today we are visiting with some uh, some friends who've come back uh, to see us again. Um, the phenomenal Terry Freeman, who happens to be the CEO. I'm just going to give the CEO, the head in charge of the right. National Civil Rights Museum. A uh, Smithsonian Institute affiliate. Hey, I didn't forget that. How, how hey are you? there, I'm good. I'm good. It's good to be back with you. And you look great. It's glad to have Thank you back. You, glad to have you back, also as well. And our friend Mendel Grinter, who happens to be the executive director of Campaign for School Equity. How are you, brother Grinter? You doing all right? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. And we we enjoy your energy when you're on the show with us. You know. I appreciate you guys for having me. So uh, <laughs> it's the least I could do. Well, th- th- that's what I like. The least he could do, he could bring some energy, right? <laughs> Let's jump right into this thing. Um. Mendel, uh, the campaign for school equity, how you got there, where you originate from, not, you know, not birth, of course, but uh, a little bit before you got here to Memphis. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I was born and raised in Louisville, uh, like my good man, Larry Robinson. So, Oh, God. Um, Louisville, Louisville, Mississippi? <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, um, okay. um, Louisville, but go Cats. Um, but I, I moved to Memphis two and a half years ago uh, from New York City, um, and I was originally coming to lead uh, the chapter here for a national organization called the Black Alliance for Educational Options. And um, in late 2016, that national organization kind of went through some challenges and decided they wanted to shut down their operations. Um, but myself and my team kind of felt like, you know, there's a lot of work to do uh, on behalf of children here. And so um, kind of rolled up our sleeves and we launched Campaign for School Equity in July 2016. And uh, the last, you know, two years or so um, that we've been here, we've been all about kind of engaging the community around the, the education landscape here. And Last fall, we took a shift to start organizing students. So we've been partnering uh, with 10 local high schools here to teach students about civic engagement and advocacy. So um, we spend a lot of our time uh, teaching these kids what the power of organizing and leveraging their voices. And so um, we've, we've been doing that work. Uh, we're passionate about it, and we look forward to continuing that work for as long as we can. Speaking of leveraging voices and speaking of power and speaking of, uh, of, of, of commingling of people and diverse backgrounds, Terry Freeman, I mean, I don't even need to introduce you. You've been on here so many times. Everybody in the world knows you. You think? Yes. (laughs) I think they do now. (laughs) I think they do. You know, what you do in that space that you all have created and what you're doing, the platform that the National Civil Rights Museum has, is phenomenal. I know many people that come to this city, they want to go to the National Civil Rights Museum, and that's a testament to the work that you all have done. Well, you know, I think that we want to tell the true story of the history of the civil rights movement, and the museum has really done a, a lot of work to, to make sure that we are uh, truthful. Yeah. And truth isn't always pleasant, but it's truth. So, you know, I like to think that the museum um, has a platform that it can also share so that people like Mandel who are doing good work in a space that is certainly or was and continues to be a part of the civil rights um, um, issues has an opportunity to work with the museum uh, and use the platform that the National Civil Rights Museum provides. I think that's a good segment to talk about the work that you're doing with the students, but also what's important in the community around economic justice. So how are the two working together to make sure that students understand the role of education mm-hmm. in that equation of economic justice. So for a lot of our kids, you know, um, we have kids in schools from all over the city, and so they're coming from 
uh, different backgrounds, and we kind of start off with just them understanding that they um, have power in their voice and their opportunity. So a lot of times when we start off at the beginning of the school year with our kids, we're like, you know, what are some challenges in your community? What are you seeing uh, that you think are preventing you and your family from moving beyond your current circumstance? Or even at your school level, what's preventing you and your fellow students? Um, and right off the bat, we hear a deep entrenched policy issues coming from our students at the local and the state level. So we always frame it around, you know, education, but extend it to community broaders. But we're hearing that our school facilities are bad. We're not, you know, our schools are not funded as they should be. There are tons of discipline challenges for our, our students who attend maybe some of the lower performing schools, um, and, and they're comparing that with their more affluent friends who are busted in from around, from around the county. And so um, we always kind of walk through our curriculum with them understanding those issues and how you solve those those issues at the local level and at the state level. And um, you know, last week we just took a, a group of 100 of our kids up to Nashville to meet with legislators. And for a lot of our kids, it was their first time. They never met you know, their state representative right here in their district. They didn't really understand uh, the dual government that we have here in Memphis yeah. with, the, with the county government and the city government. Mm -hmm. Who's responsible for, for money moving into schools? And um, it, it was really great to see students kind of take what we've taught them over the last semester and kind of use that in their conversations with legislators. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kentucky Network. Terry, I want to I want to bring you in on something right there. He, he said kids have power, and, and and they're helping build that platform, that that space for them. But but wasn't integration supposed to be one of those things uh, when it was thought of back in the um, early six, well <laughs> before the early '60s, but fully implemented, I guess, in the '60s? That integration was supposed to solve some of these issues now that we've got on the horizon and that have been with us now for say low twenty years in terms of low performing schools. You got you got deteriorating schools. I mean, I mean, wasn't that supposed to be uh, an all boats rise kind of issue when it, integration hit? It was, and I think for a while it it did that. I think that for a while you did see significant improvement in uh, schools that were predominantly serving African-American kids, where you began to see um, the, the level of the facilities look more in line with uh, their counterparts in white communities, that resource acquisition, you know, that they had access to uh, correct tech textbooks. Uh, you, you always did have really strong teachers, though, in those schools who were very dedicated. I think what has happened over time is that um, local schools are connected to community. And when you have a um, community that has become disenfranchised and, and segregated, then the schools are going to be disenfranchised and segregated. I still happen to believe that Education is the great equalizer, but I, I will qualify that by saying I think quality education mm -hmm. is the great mm -hmm. equalizer. So, so we've been resegregated, Latanya Mendel, and Terry, for for lack of a better term, if we've been resegregated in, in urban cores like the Memphises and the Chicago's and the New Orleans and the you know, then <laughs> I want to know what's the next. What do we do next, Mendel, Latanya? I mean, what what do we do next, y'all? We've gotten we got into the integration part and at work for a while, but now we're we've gone back. Our neighborhoods are, are, are the value and the properties are gone now, and people have moved out. But we still have a, a a child that needs to be educated. What do we do? We have to meet children and and families where they are. So when when I think about schools, I look at what's happening with magnet schools and things like that. So where schools, kids who are interested in math and sciences are grouped together with those like-minded students. Students who are interested in the arts are like with the, you know, lumped together and the curriculum supports that along with internship, externship, that whole complete pathway of education to work is is where we're headed in some of those as as a response mm -hmm. but the key the, the question that I that keeps coming up is is how do we pay for all of this because when you have the communities what we've talked about is that we've reintegrated because the tax base has moved when people have options of where they live, they move, and when they move, their tax base goes with them, and that's the money that's used to fund the educational system. I, I actually think, and I'm not an expert on this, but I think that we have to begin to develop a new way of funding our schools, mm -hmm. our, our public school system. I'm not certain that I have an answer to that. But the other thing that I'd like to mention is that I think that we must expect excellence 
from all students. And frankly, I don't want to focus too much on the fact that our schools have resegregated. I want the kids who are in the schools to get educated. Mm -hmm. And I don't want us to waste a whole bunch of energy and time Mm -hmm. trying to figure out how we get schools integrated again. I want to figure out how we're going to make sure that the next Bill Gates is going to be able to come from one of our schools. And and I would just say, I think we have to think about this as a a holistic approach, right? It's not just solving education because we could could theoretically fix schools and still end up with some of the same challenges because our communities are still um, missing a lot of the resources and supports that they need. I think, you know, in my world, it's all about policy and how we affect change at the local and, and state level when we talk about policy changes. And so for a lot of these communities, it is getting a lot of the wraparound and, and the whole child services that these kids need to make sure that even though, you know, they could be in a, in a world-class school getting a great education, but they're still going to go home deeply impoverished. And, and if we don't address those issues, if we don't think about housing, if we don't think about funding and if for a community aspect, then we're not going to really move the bar as much as we can. That's so what we're talking about, moving the bar. You are listening to Funky Politics on the Kentucky Network. So this dance floor is only going to be about a matter of time before you get loose and start to lose Go ahead and rock your eyes Cause we're celebrating no more drama In our life With a great track pump And everybody's jumping Go ahead and twist your back And get your Funky Politics Kazookian Artivism Artivism features conversations With artists, creatives, and citizens Working at the intersection of art and social activism And I'm Linda Steele, your host I'm a grant maker, change maker Social venture capitalist And I invest in individuals and projects that use the arts as a vehicle for social change. Artivism on the Kazookian Network. Kazookian! Funky politics. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kentucky Network. I'm DC, your host, along with my good friend, Tanya Robinson. How are you, Latanya? I am good, DC. How are you today? I'm great. And it's just, man, it's good to have you here with us. It's good to be here. Thank you for allowing me to sit in the big chair. No, I got a smaller chair for you. Later. <laughs> <laughs> Visiting with us uh, at, on, in the studio today, we've got Terry Freeman, who happens to be the uh, president and CEO of the National Civil Rights Museum right here in our very own town, y'all, Memphis. Welcome to the program, Terry. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to be here. It's always good to have you back with us. Thank you. You're just a regular on the show. Oh, you know? thank you so much. I feel right at home. I, I'm glad to know that. And we've got Mendel Grinter. Mendel, this is your fourth, fifth, or twentieth time here with us, <laughs> I think, or something like that. Mendel is the executive director of Campaign for School Equity. Welcome to our program again, sir. Thanks for having me. I'm just trying to be a regular. Yeah. <laughs> you may have my job before it's over with. The producer not, but anyway. You know, we want to we want to take a deep dive, y'all. Let, let's talk about public education, where it is, I mean, and basically where it's come from. And and I, let's just talk, let's frame it from fifty years back. Uh we know that we had a, a person in, in the in the personality of Dr. King who was killed in our city some almost fifty years now, in April. And um there were a lot of things that he talked about. Not only just prior to it, but he, it was a part of his mantra the entire time, and education was a big piece. Tell us a little bit about a piece of work that you all have worked on, um, the an education dream and where we are right now with that dream and where we've come from. Yeah, so we um, decided to um, put out this book project called An Education Dream, uh, really honoring Dr. King's legacy. Um, and, and we got this idea from looking at the National Civil Rights Museum and everything they were doing uh, with their year-long commemoration, uh, MLK 50. Um, and we, we said, you know, as an education organization working with the community, uh, we wanted to honor Dr. King and his legacy, but we didn't want to do it at just kind of the same old, you know, post a quote here or there and, and, and just, you know, kind of, we really yeah. wanted to dig deeper and say, you know, where has education gone? And especially for uh, our children. And we, we kind of honor the Memphis story. So we dig back and we connect with members of the Memphis 13 who were the first to desegregate schools here in Memphis and we kind of work our way through history up until present day Um, but we really you know the Memphis story uh, while it's unique it could be any 
any city in this country, New York, Chicago, my hometown in Louisville, Oakland, um, any major city where you have an, a large majority of black children who are going to school and are not getting the best education possible. Um, and so uh, we reached out to, to Terry and the museum um, uh, about the project and we really wanted, we didn't want to start doing it. And, you know, they're like, wait a second, don't do that. That doesn't really fit with, you know, how we're honoring him. And um, we had some conversations with them, and then we just kind of got to work. Um, and we interviewed a number of local folks here uh, who are engaged in this work. We reached out to school board members in Memphis 13, and we talked to uh, a few national leaders like Dr. Fuller. Um, and then we connected with uh, former Obama Education Secretary John P. King. Uh, had a really great conversation with him, and um, we kind of kind of set this in motion. And so what we what we do. Um, is we go back to kind of some of the landmark cases, Brown v. Board, uh, and a lot of the these these Supreme Court cases that talked about separate, but but equal and separate and non equal, and making sure that kids could could go to school. And we kind of work our way. Um, and I think that the most important thing about this piece is um, talking about Memphis, right? Because I think a lot of folks in the last couple of years still don't understand how we are at the education system that we are in today. How we have a, a Shelby County school district here that is the, the largest school district in our state, but then we also have the, the State Achievement School District, and then if you go out a little bit farther out of the city, you got six municipal districts, and um, we really wanted to break a lot of that content down into something that was easy, it was recognizable, uh, and folks that really could connect with. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kaduki Network. Man, now that's a great story, so tell us a little bit about the Memphis 13. So for those of us who aren't from Memphis who want to know the history, let's start there and tell us a little bit about them and then um, some of the other stories that are in the book. Yeah, so the Memphis 13, um, you know, these 13 school children who uh, desegregated um, a number of elementary schools here in Memphis, um, I think what was so important uh, about this is, you know, seven years prior to uh, them stepping foot onto the campuses of these elementary schools, uh, the Supreme Court had already passed down their ruling. Um, and, and we talk about it a little bit in the book, but you saw places like Little Rock in Arkansas uh, with with the Clinton uh, group. You you saw these cities kind of rush to desegregate, but Memphis kind of kind of eased into it a little bit. It took seven years after this this landmark case um, before. The, these parents decided to send their children to these schools, and we had the, the pleasure of talking to uh, four four surviving members: uh, Miss Joyce White, um, uh, Miss Sheila, and, and Sharon Malone. Uh, Mister, uh, uh, I'm blanking on it's, names here. No, no, it's a no, number it's okay, of names. It's okay. um, but we had a chance to connect them, and, and, and it took a while too, because what we didn't want to do was just kind of like, oh, hey. Memphis 13 member, let me ask you all these questions. Yeah. But we actually, we, 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 um, we spent a lot of time. We first connected uh, with Professor Daniel Kill over um, at, at the College of Law um, at Rhodes. And we kind of had some conversations back and forth with him because um, he had done a lot of work with the Memphis 13 prior. And then we slowly kind of eased ourselves in the connection. We talked to Miss White and we didn't even make any any real ask of, of any of them. We just kind of talked to them. And then um, the closer we got towards the book, um, we, we kind of explained the project and sat down with them more. And they kind of naturally kind of just shared information with us. And we were really careful about, you know, how much of that we actually shared, you know, in the book and, you know, access to them. So a lot of folks are always like, oh, I'd love to get them, you know, to do this sure. or do that. And it's like, no, that's not really, you know, what this is about. Mindy, let, me, let me put a pin right there. Terry, I want to bring you in on this because you said something I thought was really interesting. You said Memphis took its time. Of, of of bringing on integration, Terry. That that's is that not the story around the country with a with a lot of large urban districts. I I think I even read where some just decided to close the district down altogether. Absolutely, and and then you had these private schools to be born out of out of nowhere all of a sudden. Now. If you look at the founding dates for many private schools, mm -hmm. you will see that the founding dates interestingly coincided with the desegregation of schools um, in certain cities. So uh, th that is not unusual. I mean, I think it I think D.C. and Baltimore were the first two schools, school districts to actually desegregate mm -hmm. after the um, um, Brown v. Board uh, with all deliberate speed. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was, I mean, 1970 before Mississippi schools were were um, in, in, integrated. So that's not unusual. And I think that for me, that's why, as we talk about 
where schools are with regard to integration. Um, I, I don't want to spend another 10, mm-hmm, 15 years mm-hmm. trying to figure out how we get schools fully integrated. Um, I do want to spend time, though, really focusing on how we make sure that what we're teaching young people is going to actually land them in some productive space that does allow for um, people to thrive and um, uh, that equity issues become less of an issue Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we are using education the way it should be used. And and Terry Terry makes a a really great point about integration, right? Um, We've gotten past the point where we can keep talking about this need and this desire to integrate schools because what we know, if you think about, you know, once Memphis began to desegregate, you had programs like the optional school program here that was created, right, to stop white flight because what was happening was you could integrate these schools, but it's not going to prevent these more affluent, these white parents from taking their children and leaving. Sure. And we've, we've seen that in the last couple of years in Memphis with the, the creation of these municipal districts, right? No matter what we do or how we push it, folks are still going to move their move their kids. And so we, we'd be better off, like Terry said, focusing on the children who, do, who we do have who are here and making sure those equity issues disappear. I, I want to add one last thing to this conversation is that we keep talking about these things as though they were a distant past. Mm-hmm. We have to remember that these students that we're talking about are in their early 60s mm-hmm. if they were in elementary school. So yeah. they're not that old. It's not as though it's many generations and things like that. And so we have to recognize that what we talk about as history is still present. It's, mm-hmm. it's very new. And it's an important part of this story, so it's a small piece of it, but it's an integral piece of, of the whole pathway of education. Folks, get your copy of An Education Dream, and you're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kadukian Network. on jazz. This next gentleman we're talking about has an unforgettable voice. My sugar is so refined. Jazz was the happiest. Yeah, Since Galloway really. went to my school. Oh, really? Yes, he's not an alum because he didn't graduate. He has some gigs to do. <laughs> Griffin on jazz. On the Kazookian Network. Funky Politics. Over and over, it's become the iconic footage. Students running from a school with their hands up. Columbine, Sandy Hook, and now Parkland. School shootings so familiar, they go by just one name. Images that look so similar. And yet each time, new families are ripped apart. According to Every Town for Gun Safety, this is the 18th time a gun was fired on school grounds this year. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazookian Network. I'm D.C., your host, sitting in along with uh, Latanya Robinson. Hey, Latanya, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me today. How are you? Well, you know, I'm kind of sad. It's, it's, it's warm outside, and I've got a hoodie on. I think it's cold. <laughs> My body's saying it's cold, but outside says it's 90. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I'm weird like that sometimes. Uh, also visiting with us this evening, we have got Mendel Grinter, who happens to be the executive director of Campaign for School Equity. Welcome to the program, Mendel. Thank you for having me. Now, I tell you, it's good to have you back. Good to have you back. And the phenomenal and only, one and only, there's only one, Terry Freeman, the, I wanna, I'm going to call it the historian slash <laughs> curator slash catch-all, be-all lady and the president and CEO of the National Civil Rights Museum. It's always glad to, always good to have you on this program. Good to see you, too. Actually, there are a lot of Terry Freemans. I've tried to Google myself, and I've come up with a whole bunch of others. <laughs> we only know one, and it's you. <laughs> we know your address down there, okay? You know, uh, it's all, always good to have fun with you all, but, you know, in this space that we're in right now, uh, I think our country's in a very um, a sad place. Uh, once again, we have had... Um, an individual to take lives on a campus, uh, one of our school campuses, and um, and it's a sad day in America. And this is not the first time it's occurred. We've had this happen now for a low number of years, uh, but just this year alone, we've had 18 incidences on campuses, not necessarily that resulted in death, but 18 uh, gun violence incidences that some of us have heard of and some of us may not have heard of. What are we, what's next, <laughs> Terry? From your perspective, Mendel, I mean, mm-hmm. what what's next, guys? Where do we go next? How do we tell our parents it's okay to send uh, 
uh, Ravern or, or Daryl to, to school today. He's going to be great. And then I heard one guy say, you know, I sent my daughter to school today. I knew she was safe. And then she comes back to me, and I have to put her in a hearse. What what do we tell those parents then? I think, I think one, I think we have to recognize that there are a few spaces in this country where we, we know automatically we should be safe. A school, a church, place yes. of worship, yes. a movie theater. And yes. we've had guns and deaths in all of them. And so I think wow. what we have to do is say— Hold on. Stop right there. Yeah. I, no, hold on. You— a movie theater, church, and school. Think about the the three places you go where you just you, you they say just take off everything and reveal you. I mean, you 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 relax and a concert, concert, yeah. mall. I mean, think about that. I mean, I mean we could keep going down the list. Life. Yeah, but those three in particular that mm-hmm. I'm thinking about. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mindy. Go ahead. Finish. No, no. I, it, it, and I think we have to one recognize that those places may not be safe anymore. And if they're not, then we have to say it is time for us to take some some action. I think every time this happens, it, it, it's it's like, you know, um, when I moved to New York City, I was so overwhelmed coming from Kentucky because there were so many people who were asking me for money on the street. Yeah. And back home, it, it might be one fewer there or here or there, but in New York, it's so many. And so you become desensitized to it that you just walk down the street like nothing's happened. And that's what's happening with these school shootings, that we wow. we get used to these cycles. Of, we see it on the news and it's a 24 hour cycle and we're sad and we send out our thoughts and prayers. And then we argue with folks on Facebook because people love guns in this country. And then we turn around and it happens again. Mm-hmm. First, it was an elementary school. Then it's a high school. And, and the, the saddest thing, I think, about this is to get on Twitter and to see these kids live tweeting a school shooting while other kids who have gone through something similar coach them through that process. Get under the desk. Move away from the door. Push it up against there. Don't make a sound. We'll let you know when it's clear on Twitter. Keep your phone light low. We have to have real conversations about the next steps here and it starts at policy change it's not a you know terry i want you to jump right there before it goes to policy change are these the next civil rights leaders right here these young people oh who absolutely have faced mm-hmm. exactly mm-hmm. what mendel is saying now they have they faced it well and you think about what drove the civil rights movement sure, was the pe- experiences that people had gone through sure. that they were tired of going through right and mm-hmm. they were young I guess when we talk about places where we're safe, I think we have to assume when we walk outside our door, somebody's packing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's a gun somewhere. Wow. No matter where you are. Wow. So we have to kind of go into our daily existence, understanding that the potential is always there. That said, I'm not one who believes that we should be living in fear. We have got to live our lives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But we also be we really need to be helping people figure out how to cope in today's society because clearly there are issues with people being able to cope. So you have a lack of coping skills and guns, you yeah. got a problem. You got a problem there. You got right? a, you're listening to Funky Politics powered by mm-hmm. the Kazuki Network. I remember being at home on the morning of Sandy Hook and thinking that as these babies were dying and and that the world consciousness would change Mm -hmm. because it was babies. This 2018 shooting feels a lot differently because in 2014, it was the parents speaking for those babies. But now it's these students mm-hmm. themselves who are speaking for themselves. So getting back to the conversation about the civil rights and being able to talk about your learned experiences, these children are out there ready to talk about policy. They're like, we don't want prayer anymore. Right. We need policy mm-hmm. change. We need wow. gun control and they things did like say that. that too. They, oh, they are been yeah. on social yeah. media and they've stayed. So there's three marches scheduled over the next um, 60 days. Yeah. There's the Women's March. March, there's I can't remember the middle March and then the, the, the 420th the yes, mm-hmm. right. and then the 420 mm-hmm. March that the students themselves yep. a national March that they they've staged and they're gearing up for to let's All talk about their the rights mm-hmm. and, and and they're they're getting people involved because they can speak for themselves right. this is their learned experience yeah. they've seen the last 20 years when nothing has happened and they feel like adults have let them down yes Completely. we have, have they Terry we have, have failed yeah. these young people that's what I thought when and we're going we want to press them yeah. to learn while they're in yeah. school at the same time we're not willing to do anything to keep them safe mm-hmm. while they're in school and I personally don't think having 
armed guards at the front of your school is a protective measure. That ain't going to do nothing. What I will say is that if I were a legislator in Florida, I would be concerned about my job right now. The voting age for early registration voter for high school students mm-hmm. in Florida is 16. Mm-hmm. And these kids are on it. They're getting registered. And, and, and having worked with high school students here in Memphis on education issues, I know that these kids, they see what's going on. They're not oblivious. You, you, you know, I, I know their parents probably think they spend all their time on their phones doing nothing. They're doing something, and they're organizing themselves for change. And so I think if I were a legislator, I would be prepared to, to, to lose my job because what we can't have is this this partisan game. These students are like, oh man, you know what? I, I'm, I'm a Democrat. Oh, I'm a Republican. Oh, let's make America yeah. great. I again. bet there were some Democrats and Republicans that were shot. Listen, well, well, and I, I want to go right there. Exactly. I want to go there. I want to go to this, exactly. this partisan piece you're talking about. I'm going to play the con side. Well, now wait a minute. You're talking about taking away my my second my second amendment right to be able to bear my arms, right? I want to be able to bear arms, and, and since that's occurred, now we can have them in our cars. And I've talked to many police officers; that was the wrong policy, right? Well, you can have these unchecked weapons in your vehicle, right? And so people are breaking in, and what they're stealing guns. But now you've got people who have legal, legitimate rights to have weapons, and they think. It's nothing wrong with me having an AR-15, Mendel. And you ought to just get over it. There is no... Get over there it, Terry. Is, there, is, there is no reason for anyone to have an AR assault rifle with a large bump stock in, in, in the world that we live in today. In this country, I like where a lot our of military can That's take on saying. two Gulf-sized wars at the same time in 15 to 16 small incursions on domestic soil, there is no need for a weapon that large and in the hands of a teenager with serious mental health problems. There's no need for that. And if you feel like you need that large of a rifle, then you need to have a conversation. And and, and I think we, we get caught up in this idea that we have this right to bear arms and this living document that can be changed. When, when the Constitution was created and that amendment was put in, and there was a legitimate fear that you needed a weapon to defend your home against yes. someone coming in. There is no need for you to have or feel like you need to have these large weapons but you in can, your home right now. You can still have a weapon to defend your property yeah. and, and your person. I don't think it takes an AR-15 assault. Mm. That is a military weapon. And what do they do in the military? Yeah. They're not hunting no. deer. No, they're not hunting They're hunting yeah. people. Hunting. But, and then just think about the basic things. So just to get a car here and a driver's license. So we've regulated licenses, right? In order Mm. to drive a car, you have to have a driver's license, you have to have insurance, you have to be registered. Why don't we have that same type of legislation for guns. Follow the money. That's the national You are listening rifle. to Funky Politics powered by the Kazuki Network. Go ahead. I know where you're going. The Go National ahead. Rifle Association and it's where these kids are starting. They have compiled a list of these legislators and lawmakers who um, have received funding from this association and they lobby every single year, local and state politicians to support the Second Amendment Follow right. the money. And they have said over and over again, they refuse to accept any regulation on the, the sale and purchase of these guns. And that's where we need to start. Like Terry said, follow the money. That's where we have to start. I want to take an informal poll here. So and let's let's just say that these young people, and I, there are some that are going to Tallahassee, I think Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're going to go to Tallahassee. Will this time be a time that you believe that the country will say, okay, we've had enough. Let's start doing something. I mean, just around the table. It feels different this time. It, it really does feel different. It feels because different. Okay. It feels different because the students themselves mm-hmm. are leading mm-hmm. this initiative rather than the parents or the government or the, the legislature. Mm-hmm. The mm-hmm. students themselves mm-hmm. are speaking. And, and so it feels different. So, yes, I think change is upon us. I, I think it does feel differently mm-hmm. as well. And, and I think... Some of it is that, you know, this idea that, okay, I'm 17 today, but yeah. guess what? By the time 2018 November rolls around, yeah. I will be 18 and I will be voting. So you can take me for granted if you want to. Yeah. I'm going to make my voice count. And I know that I have to work within the system. I, my hat is off to these young people mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, who are... You know, I heard a young lady on on television say adults are um, in some ways handicapped by money. Right. We yeah. always think about, well, what's going to be the yeah. financial yeah. repercussion? Yeah. Young people ain't got no money. No. So they got a lot of emotion. They got a lot of uh, a lot of energy. And I think, frankly, that 
what we need to be doing is just helping God. We do not need to be telling these young people what they need to do. Mm -mm. We guide them, help them better understand how the system works and doesn't work and let them loose. And I say, yeah. I say th this time is definitely different, and not just this school shooting, but we've seen young people begin to really step up and speak out in a lot of ways. Kansas right now is scrambling because they have a, a number of 16-year-olds into their governor's race yeah, because they said that. they are tired of adults not being able to get things done. Um, you, you see, happy President's Day. Uh, I, I'm observing 40, 44 out of 45. But oh, in gosh. response to that last this election, is cold you 45 see day, sir. a number – a number of students begin to speak out about that process and how we elect even our nation's leader. And so I think definitely it feels different. I think exactly what Terry said. We need to be supporting these yeah. students and getting out of their way, quite frankly, mm -hmm. because I think they are tired of it. They've you know, had enough. And is, is, I think is social media a major, major driver to this? Do you think social media, uh, li like media, it, think about this now, yeah. in the 60s, yeah. When, when when you could show the world that uh, that you were putting hoses on kids and on women and on defenseless people and sticking dogs mm -hmm. on them, that's when America that's when America was was forced to understand that we've got a major major problem. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's when you had that rush. Yeah, that's when you had the rush to civil rights acts. Mm -hmm. So so Latanya, so so will this social media campaign that they're using and they're great at it. They're great at it, and, and so it, it, it gives them one. It gives them a foundation, a platform to stand up on, but it also gives them access to resources to raise money. Mm -hmm. And so uh -huh. that now they're not limited to just what's happening in their local zip code, that we, with crowdfunding and some of the other technological advances that are out there today, yeah. they can get the support that they need to support their views and then start to perhaps cause change. Mm -hmm. And that's huge. So social media, partnering uh -huh. with everything that's happening right now, is just getting ready to explode. Yeah. And we've seen students. and we've seen, you know, in the last couple of years, cities across this country where where these students have used social media to say, hey, you know what? I'm bored. Let's meet up at Oak Court Mall at seven o'clock. Sure. And they descend on the mall. And it's happened in cities around the country. And right. so I think if students can use social media for for just boredom and that purpose to organize like that, I'm I'm I, I cannot wait to see how they leverage it to use it uh, towards policy change. And, and I don't think things are happenstance. I mm. think this being the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King and all of this stuff happening this year, yeah. this is divinely ordered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And oh, I Lord. believe, in fact, that the messages that King left with us, his legacy is getting ready to be really played out in very, very interesting ways. And you're going to have young people he was again. young. That's right. Again. He was, a, he was 39 again. when he died. Exactly. That's young again, to me. Again, you're going to have young people mm -hmm. leading the charge. Mm -hmm. We started getting really, really upset when we saw those kids in Birmingham and in Jackson, Mississippi, hosed down with water cannons. Mm -hmm. When Bull Connor did it in Birmingham, the country got mad. White folk and black folk got upset mm -hmm. and said, Not, this is enough. This is enough. And so I'm hoping that out of this conversation that we're having today, that out there in the stratosphere, our folks are going to get energized behind these young people. Terry, Mendel, Latanya, and say, look, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. If the bump stock has got to go, it's got to go. Mm -hmm. If you're not, there's no reason you need an AR-15. It's not that many deer out there at one time. And if you're that bad a shot, you need glasses. Bottom line to it, okay? You need glasses. Get rid of the AR-15, folks. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. Funky politics. The off-year electorate, the midterm electorates, are older, less diverse, more conservative. You have two electorates fighting for the future of this country. And what I'd say to your viewers and, and people listening in is, you know what? You got to stop that older, more, less diverse electorate from funking it around with your future. Funking up your airwaves and jamming the good information in your ear. Once again, it's Funky Politics. Funky Politics. R&R &R on sports. Artivism. Best in blue. Funky Politics. Blues in the basement. Neighborhood Connect. Riffin' on jazz. On the Kazookian Network.
A newly released report by the Southern Education Foundation says a majority of all public school students across the United States come from low-income families. Experts say that could have important implications for the nation. For more about that, we're joined now from Washington by Lindsay Layton. She covered the story for the Washington Post. So the numbers have been getting worse over time, right? I mean, 10 years ago, it was only four states that had uh, more than half their populations, the school children populations qualify for free or reduced lunches. Now it's 21 states. That's right, Hari. We've seen a, a really rapid acceleration in, in this group of kids. And of course, you know, um, people point to the 2008 recession as, as something that really made these numbers explode, but we've seen continued acceleration. It hasn't stabilized, it's getting worse, and now we're at 51%. So a majority of, of public school kids qualify for free food. So what are some of the other strains on the system? In your story, I remember seeing that basically teachers are starting to act more than just teachers. They're social workers, they're psychologists. Well, if you talk to any teacher in a, in a high poverty school, they will tell you that they spend a, a huge amount of their time just making sure the kids are okay. I mean, these kids don't come into school wondering, am I going to take a test today? They come into school wondering, am I going to be okay? You're listening to Funky Politics, <laughs> powered by the Kazookian Network. I'm DC, your host, and I got my laughing friend, Latanya. <laughs> I'm just joking. Latanya Robinson, who is sitting in with us. Hey, Latanya, how are you today? I'm great. How are you this afternoon? You're happy today, aren't you? I am in a really good mood. It's are warm. You? It's February. The days are getting longer. And you're energized. I like and that I'm energy energized. from you. Energized, <laughs> absolutely. Wow, I tell you, well, that's something else there. Seeing you like this, you know, it's great. Uh, sitting here with us today, Tanya, we've got uh, two uh, well-renowned um, civic activists uh, who not only um, call Memphis home, but they call Tennessee home as well. I think you got to have both at one time, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got Mendel Grant, who happens to be the executive director of Campaign for School Equity. Mendel, how are you? I'm well, man. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to have you back. Glad to have you back. And also, our good friend. Boy, I tell you, she's like a friend to everybody around the whole country. <laughs> and that is Terry Freeman, the president and CEO of the National Civil Rights Museum. And, and you know, the National Civil Rights Museum is a Smithsonian Institute affiliate, correct? Correct. You got it. Uh, I like that. I like that. A lot of my friends uh, from out of town, they come and they say they just love the love the platform that you all have created. Let's, let's jump into this thing. We've been talking off a little, a little offline about education, uh, the poverty that uh, some of our students have faced uh, as they're trying to, to make it to school every day. You know, uh, they go home back to the same poverty that you have been teaching about or preaching about in your classroom, and these still these students still have to go back to the same old way of doing things. Um, I don't know where to start with this piece. We've talked about poverty education on this show for some time now, and it appears that the needle is not moving still. Is anybody listening? Terry, Latanya, Mendel? I mean, I think, I think so. The first thing I think I would say is um, not to dwell or use poverty as an excuse for why these kids can't learn because I think we've seen, okay. you know, we've seen instances where. Uh, kids can come from immense poverty and still learn. I think the conversation should shift to the generational poverty that affects kids when they go home. And so, you know, myself and a lot of my friends who are first generation college students, we often have the conversation because it's as we begin to see ourselves rising out of poverty, we still have family and in, in, and friends back home who we are trying to help, who we are wanting to support. And, and so you, you truly never get out of poverty because you are still entrenched in, in wanting to help family members and those things. So I think there's a there's an interesting conversation to be had about you know first generation students as they begin to ascend and take that education and use that, then how do you rise out of poverty? So, so is that a mindset then? Are we talking about a mindset or are we talking about a state of being? I don't, I don't, I don't think it's a, you know, it, it could be a mindset, but I think it, it, there are real individuals who are first in their families or even second generation college students who are kind of themselves rising out of poverty but then are still held on uh, by the fact that they have family and friends to support. I think what a lot of folks, you know, fail to realize is that, um, you know, this poverty has been cycling on for generations and generations to come. And a lot of, you know, these white kids who um, are more wealthy and well off, they're doing so because their family has, has been able to p pass down wealth over generations. And so, you know, if you're trying to play catch up or if you're trying to just move yourself out of it, you still have 
family that you have to get back and support. So, you know, you might have a great career and a great job, but, you know, you might be spending a certain amount of your resources and giving it back to mom and dad and families. And so I think there's a conversation to be had about how that impacts some of the numbers that we're talking about. And I, I, I just wanted to interject that I do think that there is a big difference between income and wealth. Mm-hmm. And so explain that. Explain o- that. Over Please the do. course of let's use the 50 years since we've okay. been talking about 50 years. Over the course of 50 years, we have definitely seen African Americans increase their income, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. People have mm-hmm. income. They got steady income in yes. many instances. That does not equate to wealth. Wealth which is uh, um, what you have invested in yourself and in your families and what you can pass down. And we have been so focused, frankly, on um, this idea of you graduate high school, Mm -hmm. you go to college, Mm -hmm. and you get a good job. Yes. And I think the equation now needs to be you graduate high school because you do need to graduate high school. Yes. You go on beyond high school, whatever that looks like, and you create a good job. Mm. Because when you are creating jobs, then you are creating some form of industry in a way, which then starts to develop wealth, yeah. right? So that's you're not, saying start a business, basically. I'm saying create opportunity for yeah. yourself yeah. and create opportunity for others. Mm. And that that is the way that we begin to see. You, white collar no longer equates yeah. to um, necessarily moving out of poverty. Oh, no. So I, I think about my own family situation, and we've always joked that my great-grandfather had a better quality of life than we did because although he worked on the farm, he took those revenues from the farm back to town, and he built houses. And so in the good times, he would build these houses and rent them out. When things got tough, he had the ability to sell them off. Yeah. But at the end of the day, he knew how to do something with his hands, yeah. right? So he came back, and it was important for all of him to send all of us to college so we all have these college degrees but we can't do anything with our hands right now right so right. what we're doing wow. we're in a situation right now where i work in a lot of high schools and post secondary organizations and i'm out here advocating for career and technical mm-hmm. education mm-hmm. why because to me that's the quickest pathway to entrepreneurship once you learn how to do something for yourself and you know how to do those tangible things, then you can start a business. Mm-hmm. And so I have a son right now who's 17 years old. And he's going through high school, but he's also taking classes at the community college and working on his computer engineering degree. So at the end of his 12th grade year, he'll be two credits shy of having his associate's degree. If he, as a student, comes back to me and said, Mom, I don't want to go to college my freshman year. I want to take this certification that I have because I know there are jobs out there right now that pay decent in coding, in computer engineering, Mm -hmm. and decide to do that in cybersecurity versus going to college. As a parent, that's what he's interested in, and he's able to support himself. I have to advocate for that, even though I do. And his dad have four-year degrees. You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. Then tell me, why don't we, as parents, why don't we, Mendel, and you're part of this conversation because you're working with parents on a daily, day-to-day basis, and, and Terry, you see them as they come to the museum. Why don't we advocate that, look, it's okay to have a college education, but if you're not ready to go, and we know some of our kids, and we still push them kids to college, and we know they ain't ready to go, y'all. Why don't we we push them toward a military service, or we push them toward a career in technical uh, Be- Because uh, we spent, we, you know, we spent all of this time saying that people had to go to college. I yeah. mean, that was the pathway, and, and, and back after civil rights, the pathway was high school, college, so that we can assimilate. And we along the way, the, sh- the pendulum shifted too far. So education is is good, but there has to be other pathways to choose, and you have to have people on all spectrums of those career uh-huh. and educational mm-hmm. fields. And so as a parent, particularly as black people, we have to do what's best to support ourselves to become sustainable. Right. You know, and I, I think, I still think that college is a good path. Well, I, I'm not, not down in it. No, I, I think, think all that college been, is a good path. But I'll be honest. I think college, that first four years, all it does is demonstrate if you're trainable. That's all. Wow. It tells me, oh, you can be trained. I can train you to do something, and I know you can complete it. 
That's what college does. When you start getting into master's degrees and doctorate degrees, then you start being specialized in some things. But what I think we ought to be telling young people is you do need to go on beyond high school. Mm -hmm. You got to get something if it's certification. But we ought to also be telling young people, do what you enjoy. Not only yeah. that, but get some experience in it because yes. don't go and get yeah. this four-year degree. You've never worked in a the day. field. you got a These business management degree, and I've said this on this program before, a business management degree, and all you've managed to do is get out of bed. That's right. basically all you've done. Because you don't have work experience right. anymore. Right. But you expect to get a job at FedEx or you expect to get a job at IP or to come work for Mendel as Mendel's uh, his analyst. And Mendel, you have to let people down. You have, you have, no, and then unless God help you, you're a social service agency, and you may do it anyway. I mean, think about it though. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, for me, like I'm 27, and I, I just remember, you know, uh, all oh, you're of my young. school. I tell you, you're a young guy. Yeah. All of my schooling, she was all we heard was you have to go to college. Yeah. That is the only way that you will will live a life better than than your parents, right? Yeah. Um, and, and and I'm turning around now at 27. I'm looking back, and 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 all of my friends who have bachelor's degree, they're not doing work in in what they got their degree. Right. In. Most of them, when we left school, couldn't find a job. Um. And and even now, master's degree in hand, still are like, wait a second, I cannot find a job. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do anything. And I think, man, if we would have had a conversation, just like Terry has said, where you know what, if you know you you know, maybe college is for you and you want to go, go, but maybe you could go do something else. And, and, and where I'm from in Louisville, you know, your options are limited. It's military, it's UPS, it's Ford, or you go to college. And that's it. And I imagine that for a lot of folks in Memphis, it's FedEx, it's it's these manufacturing jobs. Well, those, are, those, those, are, those are not bad corporations to work for, though, because UPS pays a, 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 a better than a living wage. And Ford Motor Company, if you're talking about working in manufacturing, I would assume if you got on as a, as a young person out of high school, you're going to make a pretty darn good living. But they can no, only no, employ right, right. so many people. Yeah, I, I mean, not there's not an I mean, infinite not, number they, of jobs. And, and I think getting to, to, to what what Tanya said was it's not necessarily what you want to be doing. We, we never give kids the opportunity to say, you know what, I think I really want to be a journalist. Let me figure out how I can do that. Or, hey, I want to do, I, I want to be a producer of a, of a radio show. Let me figure out how to do that. We never actually give kids an opportunity to express what it is they want to do and and to go out and figure out you know what let me see if i want to do it maybe i don't and i can go and transition and do something or else. i love video games and i want to know how i can create them mm, i exactly. mean there are just so many opportunities i think that we don't push yeah. on our kids to even explore and some of that's because we're limited in our own knowledge about yeah. what these opportunities are. The also thing. because we're limited in our wealth the think about well, it now, no, because my kid may not be able to sit out a year like the Obamas, right? Because my daughter got to go somewhere to work when she leaves Tennessee State. I'm just telling you the truth. But so, but what about no, 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 Can't but, come back but there I with think, me. But I think that is a, oh, I think years. that is a cultural thing that we have not mastered. Because I have, I have friends when I went to University of Kentucky who were who were well off, affluent white children, and they had the the ability to stay at home for a year if they wanted to sit out sure. or graduate with a four year degree and stay at home until they figured out what was happening. See, a lot of times, um, myself and my friends talk about it all the time because you will say, when you turn 18, I need you to get a job and get out of my house or contribute to these bills. Rather, figure out what you want to do, take yeah. some time, yeah. go to school, work, Let's figure it out. And before you leave this nest, let me make sure that you but are prepared. But why does it have to be one or the other? other? Why can't you go to school and work? So I've been in the high schools lately, and I keep saying when I was in high school, we had programs like DECA. We had programs yeah, like CC, CCE and HOE yeah, where yeah. you got work experience while you were in high school. So you were allowed to explore those things that you were interested in and those passions so that it, you at least knew. Also, when you went to college, you were expected to contribute to your college education. You didn't go and say, I'm going to take these 17 hours because I need to get done in four years. No, you took enough, but you knew that you had to work in addition to going to school to support that so that you kind of learn kind of quickly. I'm interested in this. I'm not interested in this. I need to get this internship to support my degree and be a part of that. 
You're listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kazuki Network. Now, Terry, I want to bring you in on this because you, you've got a 28-year-old, and, and mine is 18, so yours is 10 more years on me. What did you tell yours? Did you say, look, hey, dad and mom support you like nobody's business. Get your degree, and then let's figure out where do we go from there? Or, well, since or, since I have three daughters, oh, two are done with college. Yeah. Neither of them were on the four-year plan. Yeah. All, both of them were on the longer than four-year plan. And sometimes it happens. And I have one in college now. Um, one, I told all of them, I wish y'all had a hobby that paid, okay? Because wow. I think yeah. it's always good to have, you know, something that you can, you can do and you can bring, anything. bring yes. in some money. But I also told them um, that they should do what they want to do. Yeah. And yeah. I, I had an interesting experience with my older two. Both of them said to me at one point when I was working um, in uh, philanthropy, and they said, you know, we are so admirable you are admirable we like what you've done you've done great work but we have no desire to do what you've done because your days are too long oh wow mm-hmm. i don't want to sit at a desk all the time oh, wow. i want to be more in control of my schedule my hat's off to them yeah. if they can create for themselves what works and so far they both are being able to do that. And my oldest daughter, she got, majored in political science and actually is working in that, that realm. Yeah. But um, my middle daughter uh, majored in criminal justice and she is a PE teacher at a charter school. And um, what her love and passion is. what kind of is, charter school that is. Well, her love and passion is, is children. And yeah. so now what she's taken up wow. is this idea of providing uh, inner city uh, young ladies access to the sport of volleyball because wow. mm-hmm. they're told that they can play basketball, yeah, yeah. but they don't get access to volleyball and, and soccer yeah. and, 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 Cross and uh, lacrosse and, and all golf. the rest mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah. So she's trying to provide some access. Band. Yeah. Sorry. You, you had to throw that band? <laughs> I, I like mean, that. I, as, a, as a band kid myself, you know, you that, that's how our saxophone. Hey, uh, But that's alto? how I got to, Tenor. Okay. Okay. But that's how I mean. That's how I went to college. So, so Terry, the band's all here. I, I, <laughs> I think I've heard that somewhere before. The band's all here. But, but what? But what? I think what this converges on is that we all had things that we were interested in, mm-hmm. and we pursued that. Mm-hmm. Allowed education was a part of that, but we had other means. So we used band. We used work to help fund our education, mm-hmm. to help us complete that to go into these careers. Mm-hmm. You are listening to Funky Politics, powered by the Kadukian Network. Funky Politics. Elliot Perry, otherwise known as Socks. Man, thank you. How you guys doing? Mr. Earl the Pearl Monroe. Hey, thank you. Nice to be with you guys. Glad to have Mr. Allen Houston. Trying to stay warm up here in in New York. I hear you. Personality extraordinaire, Mr. Scoop Jackson. I appreciate the encore. Mr. Michael Ray Richardson. What's up, man? Glad to be here, brother. A three-time NBA All-Star. The one, the only, Detlef Shrimp. All right, Larry, thanks so much for having me. Excited to be on the show. Hi, Conversation. The Kazuki Network. Funky Politics. What a show, what a show, what a show. Man, right here on Funky Politics, we have had some heavy hitters with us on today. Terry Freeman and Mendel Grinton. I mean, bought the I, I energy, bought the passion, bought the expertise, and bought the excellence. Black excellence. Isn't that what it's all about? I mean, you know what? I, we're sitting here with... Number what Mendel? I think it, didn't he say it was twenty seven? Twenty six or twenty seven? Twenty seven. You know, I have shoes this guy's older. A, yeah, I've got a phone that's older. My flip phone is older than he is. And you know, and and this young man has created a platform that allows parents to connect in a way that they can advocate. They can be the advocates for their children when it comes to education locally. You know, and and he's given children an understanding of their power. Yeah. If I didn't get anything that, else yeah. out of his kids work today, kids have power yeah. and they know their power. Wow, and that's amazing. And can we, and Terry Freeman? Huh? When when they have to, when they talk about equity, when we talk about poverty, when we talk about education, when we talk about this this these issues that have happened around us with these young people dying in Florida, the Columbines, and we talk about 
when is the AR-15 going to be outlawed? You know, if you got a Terry Freeman, who's the president and CEO of one of the, if not the top um, uh, Smithsonian in, uh, affiliate around the country, the National Civil Rights Museum, who has the space and the platform to talk about these issues, I don't know what you can do. I mean, we, what, we've got the experts on this show here, folks. What I love about Terry's work is that although she pays homage to the past, yeah. she makes us understand that the National Civil Rights Museum, the present, we need yeah. to document what's happening now, the president, so that we, the present, so that we're prepared for the future. Well, I'll tell you this, you know, Funky Politics is one of these shows where we're going to always, folks, always, we're going to keep it real, we're going to keep it right, and we're going to keep it what? Funky! All righty. Funky Politics executive producer Larry Robinson for Kudzukian, hosted by Daryl DC Catron and Marcus M.D. Ward. Talent booking, Miko Horn. Funky Politics, recorded at Kudzukian Studio, directed, produced, recorded, and distributed by Kudzukian.